I do recall though a situation where I gave a speech one time um, and there are a few things that I learned as a result of that one speech which was to always be prepared and always make sure that I have all my equipment ready to go. So great job here in connecting me up. I remember I was, I was teaching a Sunday school class a number of years ago and I got a little lax. Um, it was about the fifth or sixth time I was teaching the class and I was reading the lesson and the material on the way to church. My wife was driving and I was throwing my clothes on and, and I, I got to class and I started talking about a particular you know, verse in the Bible and I was, I, was really, I was really moving up and down the aisle and I could see the folks in the audience. There was a couple older gentlemen on the front row and one gentleman kept going like this. And I thought, boy, I'm really motivating him. He's really getting the spirit here. You know, he kept going like this. I thought, this is great. And afterwards, I finished the lesson and I came up and I said, Joe, I really appreciate the fact that you seem to be moved by my, you know, discussion relative to this Bible verse. And Joe was a little hard of hearing. He said, what? I said, Joe, you were, you know, you were clearly, you know, obviously you're moving your arm and you must have been motivated by, you know, this, moved by the spirit about what I was saying. He said, no, no, I was telling you, your fly's been down the whole time. <laughs> So I looked down and of course, I learned that that's one of the things you always check on before speech. So I think I'm fully equipped today, but what I wanted to do here, and I've spoken with a lot of you here in this room on various occasions, and I thought what I would do would be to, to really come in and give you some practical thoughts about my experiences in the networking world. And so, as opposed to come in and tell you what you should do, I thought what I'd do might be, is come in and tell you some things I've seen that are mistakes. And I find that this is the most valuable to me when people sit back and tell me, say nice things to me about me that like Larry and Narcy and others have done. I think that's great and I very much appreciate it, but it's, I also like it when people tell me what I do wrong. You know, what can I do better? And therefore I think what's important, and particularly in networking and maybe most importantly, Job one, finding a job, finding the right job, which I think we're all looking at even when we have a current job, is what are the things that can be done better and what are the mistakes that I've seen? Now, I have had the good fortune, as Larry said, of having a lot of meals, and Larry, the, the way I think I've kept the weight off is I move a lot of things around on the plate. I just keep moving them around on the plate and I try to order very little. But what I think is important is what have been some issues that I've seen when I've talked to folks trying to help them in, in this community. And I do enjoy the notion of networking, but more importantly, I enjoy helping people find opportunities. I guess the concept of paying it forward. And I'm a firm believer that in my role as chair of the technology practice at Morris, Manny and Martin, that if I can turn people into friends, into evangelists for our law firm, then they'll be out there saying positive things about us and over the 34 years of being in Atlanta, that's worked out. So let's talk about a few things. First of all, I'm gonna give you a broad disclaimer because I'm a lawyer, I gotta give you a disclaimer, which is I reserve the right to change anything I tell you right now, change my mind at any time. If I say anything here that you later decide to use against me, I'm gonna say in, under oath that I made this disclaimer and I have a right to change my mind. But let's dig into it. First of all, what, is, what are some problems that I've seen in my discussions with people that are looking for new opportunities? One is the failure to define the position you're looking for. This happens so often. I'll sit back and talk to somebody. They'll, they'll come to me and I'll be, have been introduced and I'll talk to them and they don't really have a clear explanation of the position that they're looking for. It's sort of like the, the answer is when I say, well, what would be the perfect position for you? They say, well, just about anything. And it really doesn't help in that regard for me to be able to narrow it down. I am constantly trying to narrow down people to a point where I can figure out what boxes they fit in. Not because I'm trying to put them into a box, but I'm trying to figure out how I can help them. And in that regard, as oftentimes there's an inability to explain which jobs on the organizational chart you can best perform and prioritizing them. I tell people, listen, imagine an organizational chart. And imagine that you're in the boardroom and, and they flash the organizational chart up on the screen. Which boxes can you fill? Which ones are you capable of fulfilling? And it's amazing to me how many times people don't really have an ability to understand what those boxes are. I was in one session with a gentleman at one point and I was asking him what, what area he wanted to be in. And he actually knew what box he wanted to be in, but he had sort of the opposite problem. 
I said, what, what's the position? He said, well, I'd really like to be the CEO of a company. And I said, great. He said, I said, what kind of business? He said, a technology business. I said, tell me some ideas of the parameters within this organizational chart. Well, you know, I think I'm best suited. I'm really only looking for a company that's in the telecommunications area that has more than 500 million in revenues, that's growing at a 25% growth rate, and that has international sales where I can work on the international area as well. And I'm thinking, hmm. So I say, well, how many companies in, and by the way, I want to stay in Atlanta. I said, well, how many companies fall into that category? He said, well, I don't really know, but this is what I want to do. I mean, there were probably one or two companies, and the likelihood of finding that position was very remote. Now, that was a classic example, a polar extreme. But what it showed me was there really was very little understanding in that situation that that person had done his homework relative to what was possibly available in the community. How many folks here, by the way, want to stay in Atlanta, have a desire to stay in the, in the metro Atlanta area? How many folks would like to move out of the metro Atlanta area? Okay, so there's a couple that are in that mode. I will tell you, this is probably about the, the way the percentages are the people I meet with. Most of them want to stay in Atlanta. Most of them have, don't have a lot of flexibility and would really like to stay here. Understanding where this organizational chart is for a company is really important. And if you've isolated particular companies, understand that org chart. Go look at not just the website, but do further digging to find out about them. Because it's a huge problem especially a situation where you, know, you don't really do your homework in advance. Forgetting to describe prior work challenges and what you learned from them. This is another classic problem. I'll frequently talk to somebody and they'll say, well, I was at XYZ company for a while and, and you know, then I've left and now I'm doing this other thing. Or I'm, now I'm looking for an opportunity. Well, the problem is it's unclear about why they left XYZ company. And it's okay to say, well, I left XYZ company because I had a difference of opinion with management, or they were acquired, or a private equity fund came in. But what you don't want to do, I think, in these situations is leave the person you're talking to who's trying to help you sort of you know, up in the air without an understanding of what occurred. Now, obviously, there could be some situations that would be a little uncomfortable to talk about, but most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time, it's a situation of, you know, maybe the company reorganized, which is oftentimes what happened, or a private equity fund came in. <coughs> Excuse me. But be in a position to where you can explain that. Otherwise, you leave the person that's talking to you, that's trying to help you, up in the air, you know, sort of wondering, well, what, what might have happened there? And this is a little tricky, but you need to anticipate that question. Because that's a question, if it's not asked, it's thought about by the person that's across the table that's trying to help you. And the last thing that the person across the table is trying to help you wants to have happen is refer you into somebody else and find out that, lo and behold, there was some really serious problem there. So just dispel that. Come out and say, listen, there were some issues, and one of the key issues related to the fact that I really thought we needed to be going in X direction. Management decided to go in Y direction. They were going to shut and, you know, scale the company down. That wasn't the way I wanted to go, and we had a, had a parting of the ways. There's no problem with that. It explains the situation, too. All right, what's another problem? Not fully understanding the current market conditions and showing your ignorance in the meeting. I'll oftentimes talk to folks and I'll say, well, what, what would be the perfect opportunity for you? Optimally, what's that perfect job look like? And now back to the earlier example, hopefully it's not so narrow that there's only one or two companies out there. But frequently someone will say, well, I really think technology and I really think mobility is the way to go or I really think e-commerce or financial technology. This is frequently because I'm a technology guy and I work with a lot of technology companies. <coughs> well, then I start asking some questions about it. Well, what do you think about the mobile area or what do you think about financial technology or what are your observations in this area? And I start asking them some questions and they have very little knowledge about the market. They've read about it, they've read that it's a hot area, but they don't really understand the nature of the business itself. So doing your homework in advance becomes very, very important as part of this entire process. And it's interesting, too, because current market conditions are oftentimes hard to gauge. But what it tells me, if somebody doesn't, has not, is not in, engaging in the dialogue about those, it says, well, they're not reading the blogs. They're not updating these areas. So just be aware when, you ask that, when you're asked that question about you know, what area you're interested in and the follow-up questions of tell me a little bit about that area, be in a position to where you have some responses to that. I will tell you too, just as an aside, um, that I think it's very important in these meetings for people to be taking notes. 
and I'm a big believer in that with my colleagues as well. So if I'm sitting there talking to somebody and, and giving, you know, trying to give certain helpful advice or you're talking to someone else in that situation, you want to show that you're engaged. And it's amazing how many times I'm sitting there and I'm just looking at the person and they're just looking right back at me. And unless they have this photographic memory and can remember everything, you know, some of the things I may be saying may actually have some relevance. If you've ever been in a meeting with me, you'll know I have my laptop and I'm always taking notes. I'm usually looking at your LinkedIn profile. I mean, I already connected with Kelly Hubble, you know, out here in, in the front desk before, you know, most of you arrived today. I'm trying to find ways to keep connected and make sure that I pull information in, get it in, and then get it organized. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second as well. But be in a position where you do your current market research, because if you don't, it really causes people like me to wonder, how serious are you about this? All right, not, meet, not coming to meetings with a list of possible employer candidates. This happens a lot, okay? So I get there and somebody says, they pass through the test, they say, okay, on the organizational chart, I really, I'm, I'm equipped to be a director of finance or a CFO. You know, I'd also like to be involved in connection with the technology area, and in particular in the financial technology area. Um, I understand board governance issues. I really have a good understanding of how to you know, work up budgets and sales forecasts. And I say, fantastic, tell me some companies that you're really interested in. And frequently I'll couch the question by saying, listen, give me two or three companies that, that, that you know of that if they had this position on this org chart, you'd like to work for. Nine times out of 10, the person across the table from me sits there and scratches their head and can't, can't even come up with a name. And I'm thinking, look, I'm asking that, just assume every company in Atlanta has that org chart box and it's empty and you could work for any company, which one would you want to work for? In other words, I'm trying to get an idea of you know, what area they're interested in. And so thinking in advance of, okay, look, if it turned out that you know, XYZ company had an opening, I'd really like to work there, and here's why. I think I could provide great capability. You know, it's a situation where you can take your expertise, let's say in the telecom area, and you can say, look, I read about pin drop security the other day. This is a very exciting company. That's a company that I think I could be, provide a lot of value to because I have the technical expertise and I believe they're going to need the customer support or whatever it might be. But coming to where you're, you're relevant, you've shown you've done your homework again in advance and you have that list of candidates. I've sat in several meetings with folks where literally what they've done is they've handed me their list of companies and they said these are the ones that, are, that I'm interested in. And I'll go down that list. It also tells me, by the way, whether they really have prepared a, a, a useful list. If it has AT&T and Verizon on it or something, I may question, you know, it, have they really thought about it? But if they've really done some digging, they may have 5, 10, 15 company names on there. And frequently, they'll hand it to me, and it'll show me what the progress is. They'll also frequently have a list of people they've already talked to and people they want to talk to. I met with a guy yesterday who said, I really want to meet with, with Mr. X with this private equity fund. He probably said it five times to me. I got it. You, know, you want to meet with Mr. X, we'll figure out how to get you in front of Mr. X. But he had done homework. It's much easier for me to be able to provide advice and guidance back in that respect. Now, today's Atlanta Business Chronicle has the top 100 most influential Atlantans. Um, that's a great place to go to look down that list and see, is there somebody on that list that you want to meet? Last week's were the top 50 or whatever leading uh, executives in the technology area. So if you're interested in technology, which I think most of us probably are, go back and look at that list and see who on that list you might want to talk to. And then you can go use resources like LinkedIn to find out who those connections are. But have that list of candidates and make sure it's not just a generic list. All right, having an incomplete LinkedIn profile, less than 500 connections. How many people have fewer than, well, how many people have more than 500 connections? Raise your hand, please. Let the record reflect that's just about everybody. How many have more than 1,000 connections? How many have more than 2,000 connections? 3,000 connections? 4,000 connections? I know this guy. 5,000 connections? 6,000 connections? 7,000 connections? 8,000? What I convinced Narcy has done, though, he went to India and he got everybody in India to sign up on LinkedIn. Okay. So how many connections do you have, Narcy? 18,600, my gosh. Well, did they give you some award at LinkedIn for that? Well, they should, let me tell you. Um, John, do you take questions or do you want to wait till the end? No, I'll be happy to take questions. 
this has been, what you just presented, has been a, a topic of discussion in, in many of our meetings. Um, and there's two points of view. One is that you link with everybody. Right. Okay. And use those connections to whatever you can. And the second, which is the philosophy I believe in, is it's very difficult to link with somebody and have somebody call you and you just know them as a name or you get a list, you know, say, hey, somebody link with me. What's the advantage and disadvantages of both? I mean, I only have 350, but I know those 350, some better than others. Um, there's different school. Well, there's different schools of thought here. There's different schools of thought on LinkedIn. And basically, I think there's three schools of thought that I see. There's your school of thought, Larry, which is not a bad one, which is to say, look, if I don't know you, I'm not connecting with you. And I know you, I'll know you well, so therefore I know who these people are. The other school of thought is I'm going to connect to everybody under the sun. I mean, I'm going to go out there on a Saturday. I'm going to sit there all day, and I'm going to go when it says, wouldn't you like to connect to so-and-so? And I'm just going to keep you know, sending connection requests and hoping that one out of 100 will connect to me. All right? Some people do that. Um, and then there's the in-between model, which happens to be the model that I adopt, which is I'm basically, I've gone ahead and found just about everybody that I can connect to that I know. And then I am in a position where I'm trying to connect to other people who are connected to, very, to people that I know. So for example, everybody in this room I would hope would be, I would connect to. So if we're not connected, send me a connection request. Be nice if you put in the note, to, you know, because you can personalize them. It just says, good to hear you at the Kettering event. And I'll connect with, back with you. Now, I will we'll look at your profile to make sure you're not a convicted felon, a member of Al Qaeda, or you know, declare that you're somehow you know, a convicted felon. But short of that, I'll probably connect with you. And part of the reason why is because I, I get somewhere between two and three uh, associations as a result of my LinkedIn connections every day. And frequently, it's a private equity fund, a venture capital fund, some senior person that contacts me that says, I see you are connected to so-and-so, can you introduce me? Okay, Narcy probably gets this all the time as well. So I, I think it's, it, there's, a, there's a fine line here, but what I have found also, Larry, is the concern that a lot of people have, which is, oh, I'm gonna get inundated with all these people asking me for stuff. I've only had 10,000 and, and 122 or something connections, but but I find it, I, I don't get these requests from people asking me crazy things. And if I do get a couple of them, I just usually either forget about them or I try to do my best if it's somebody that I, that I think I can help out. So it is an interesting thought. The other thing is, one thing about LinkedIn that I've concluded, which is LinkedIn is like planting seeds, okay? You can't just go off and put a seed in the ground and a plant grows up. It takes time to do this, okay? So I tell my son and others, look, start start early and start off and continue to do it. You can't go off and just buy 100 connections on LinkedIn someplace. You gotta do it one at a time. And so if you start building it now, I figure right now with over 10,000 connections as a lawyer, I'm way ahead of most other lawyers in town. And so what, if nothing else, with my name's popping up out there in a lot of different situations and my profile is, there's some, there's some free publicity. So you gotta, you gotta weigh it, and obviously, there's some people that go crazy on it. You can see some LinkedIn profiles are just are way, out of, way out of bounds. But I do think it's a good idea to think, to think about a philosophy adopted. But I guess if I was starting out, I'd say, connect frequently and often to people you know. Failing to write, to take actions to enhance your profile, not writing blogs, articles, speeches, panels, tweets, et cetera. One of the problems that we have, I think, in looking for a job and looking for, in, in transition, is that there's a lack of relevancy, okay? And a lack of relevancy is very challenging for people that are frankly over 40 years old. I happen to be over 50 years old. Um, and so when you look at that situation, you say, how do you stay relevant? Well, one of the ways to stay relevant is to think about writing articles, blogs, giving speeches. The interesting thing about the web now and social media, it gives you an opportunity to stay relevant and to push your communication out through LinkedIn and other resources by writing about something you know. So let's just say, for example, and we have uh, some very talented CFOs in the room, I know, there's a new set of revenue recognition standards that are coming out that relate to technology and other businesses. All right, and a lot of accounting firms have written about these. What you may want to do in that situation is literally write a very short article, it could be just a paragraph or two, about those particular new guidelines as they might apply to a software as a service, a SaaS company. 
literally just a couple paragraphs, you could then link to, let's say, an accounting firm, and you push that out through your network. If you push it out through Narcy's network, that's 18,000 people that are, that are getting this. Now, I'll give you an example, too. One of the things that I started doing, I enjoy quotes, and there's a guy that sends out Friday quotes of the day. Um, and does anybody send, you know, send get quotes every week, like quotes of the day? Just, you know, you've seen those before. Well, a lot of them are really, really interesting. And I thought, well, I'll go ahead and put on my profile a quote of the day. I try to do it you know, every other day or so. Um, and the way I get these is there's an investment banking firm that sends a blurb out to me. And at the end of it, it, it says, you know, it gives a quote and it says, from Joe Smith, you know, born this day in 1874 or something. And I'll look at it if something interesting, I'll put it on my LinkedIn site. So I've got, you know, again, I've got a fair number of connections, but I put this quote there and then LinkedIn will tell you how many times people at least hit this, you know, view this quote. And the quote's short, so you gotta imagine if they're viewing the quote, they're probably reading the quote, right? So on average, what do you think is the number? I've got 10,000 connections. On average, how many people do you think actually read that quote? About that I quote about every other day. 1,500. Over 2,100. So 2,100 people somehow are reading this thing, presumably if they hit it, which astounded me. But articles may be a little different, but the idea of putting something up there that people will look at that's, that's interesting to them suggests that there are people that are really looking at these things. Now, what you can do is if you write an article, and it doesn't have to be long, it can literally be a summary of somebody else's article and then you're linking to it. We do that a lot. I'll see an interesting article and I'll put a couple sentences and then I'll put it in, you know, pop it out through both LinkedIn and there's a button there that allows you to hit, through, hit Twitter as well. And so there's ways to communicate information out that shows your relevancy. Think about that. Panels, tweets, articles, blogs, ways to get out there on topics that are relevant to you. It may be customer support issues. It may be issues relating to and the CIO issue and the international considerations. You know, there's lots of different ways to, to think about pushing it out. It keeps you sharp as well and you're constantly thinking about what you can do to build your brand in that particular way. Okay, failing to express a willingness to do the dirty work, especially with early stage opportunities. Talk to a lot of folks and they say, listen, I am willing to uh, to do certain things within a company. You start asking them questions and it's pretty clear that they aren't really willing to do many things. They want to be in the executive suite. That's where they've been before. That's where they want to be now. Well, that doesn't resonate very far, especially in the technology community anymore, unless you want to work for, no offense, AT&T or Verizon or some company that still has that, you know, top four suite. Most of the companies that I represent, we represent over 100 technology companies. Most of them are fast paced, they're in a different kind of an environment. The work charts are very flat and you know, dynamic. You know, you gotta be able to do everything from you know, crawl under the table to plug into the, uh, you know, the servers to you know, get in front of a group of venture capitals and private equity funds. You gotta show flexibility. I find so many times in these, in, in these meetings, people don't show flexibility. They say they're flexible, but you start asking them questions and they're not flexible. They don't, you know, they're not willing to do certain things. They have this, these, these constraints. And frequently those constraints are, you know, I also want to be making, you know, $350,000 a year, by the way. So they really haven't thought about the fact that nobody in this technology company is making $350,000 a year. They're making $50,000 a year, but they got, you know, presumably multi-million dollars worth of options. So I do think early stage opportunities are very relevant to all of us, and here's why. I was in Silicon Valley three weeks ago, and I asked a venture capitalist, what is it that would help a, a company in Atlanta, a technology company, to get capital from Silicon Valley? What are some things that people could do? And one of the best pieces of advice I heard, and I think it's directly relevant, and several people confirmed it, was, listen, it would be great if there's a company that is in a particular market. Let's just take the beverage market, okay? A company in the beverage market is building a system that's going to be addressing some problem in the beverage market. If you could get on your team, on the executive team, not just an advisory board member or a board member, but on the executive team, somebody that had experience in that area, the gentleman that spoke a moment ago who had been the CIO you know, of a beverage company that had international experience, that was there part of the team. If you can bring that person into the team that they're gonna be a full-time player to give that kind of credibility, working with the entrepreneurial group 
that would be substantial. That would be something that we would look at and say, boy, this, these folks really do know that market, and they brought this gentleman on as a full-time person who's willing to commit time and energy, maybe at a fairly low salary, but with lots of stock options to be able to move this company forward. It's a different angle, okay, but what it means is that that company grows, they raise venture capital, salaries go up, options go up, very interesting opportunities there. It's a way to think through the areas and experience that you have, and everybody has those levels of experience in certain areas, to, say, to go to the company and say, listen, I'm willing to come in, and I know that you're different from other big companies. I'm willing to take options, I'm willing to take a lower salary, but I want to come in and be a part of this team and help it grow. Not suggesting that this is right for everybody, but it's a great way to get your foot in the door and to show your relevant experience in a particular market. Displaying your irrelevance through dress, vocabulary, lack of social media. Boy, is this a problem. Okay, it's a problem particularly for us. And I'll hear people say, you know, we'll be talking about technology and somebody will say, well, you know, talk about the Apple Watch and they'll say, oh yeah, that's very interesting. And, or they'll talk about, um, you know, social media and Twitter and they'll say, yeah, I, you know, I really don't use Twitter and, but my kids, they're all over Twitter and, or Yik Yak or, or Instagram or something. And in other words, it, it's almost like the people that I'm oftentimes talking to disparage the technology. Well, I, I say I don't use all these technologies myself, but the problem is where companies are, including Fortune 100 companies and early stage companies, is they're all looking for these technology solutions. And if you display your irrelevance by despair, effectively disparaging or you know, backhanding the technology, you have just put yourself way down the rung. So what do you do? Well, a couple things. One is, I don't even have a pen anymore when I go. I had to go borrow a pen from Kelly out here to take a couple notes. So I've, I've pretty much gone paperless. So I'm constantly using my, my phone. I'm taking, taking notes on my phone. You know, I do have an Apple Watch. Um, and it's actually pretty interesting because most people don't. Anybody here have an Apple Watch? OK, there's one Apple Watch person. But you know, I have to tell you, it separates me. It makes me relevant. You know, it, and it's not that expensive either. But it gives you some very unique things to talk about. And it shows that this person is, is actually plugged into some of the technology solutions. So think about that in the context of the way that you might make yourself relevant. Understand also what the terminology is. You know, whether it's tweeting, whether it's blogging, whether it's, you know, whether it's yik yak. Be in a position where you go and sign up, have those accounts. And don't be in a position where you have fewer than 500 LinkedIn connections, no offense, Larry, um, because it just looks like you're not relevant if you're sitting there talking about how you want to be a part of the technology community, which just about everybody, believe it or not, is going to be a part of the technology community, even if you're working with a traditional business. The other thing is through dress and the like. I find a lot of folks, and, and vocabulary, but dress in particular, I had to go out and buy a whole new wardrobe, basically, for a number of reasons, including having lost some weight, Larry. But um, in addition to that was the idea of being, a, being relevant. So I gave a, a speech the other day. I was moderating a fireside chat with a, a venture capitalist from Silicon Valley, Bessemer Venture Partners. And I was going over to Atlanta Tech Village. And someone said to me, well, John, you're going over there, but you need to get relevant. You're not relevant. And so I said, well, what do I need to do to be relevant? And they said, what you need to do to be relevant is you got to put you got to put this on. You got to put this cool, relevant, dark T-shirt on. So, um, actually, I didn't put this cool, relevant, dark T-shirt on that some technology company gave me, but I put on a cool white T-shirt that had Morris Manny and Martin on it. Um, <laughs> and I sat there and I put a jacket on. And interestingly, the jacket that I put on was because um, the, these young people also, believe it or not, everything's got to be tight. So, you know, I had to have this cool tight jacket, so I felt really constrained, but I was sitting there and I had my, my t-shirt on, my tight jacket on, and I'm, we actually did this via, via video conference, which was interesting, with the Silicon Valley Venture Capital Fund. So the, the idea is think about how you can be relevant. Have something that's novel. You know, don't, have, don't walk in with your Blackberry either, please. You know, but try to, try to come in with some element of relevancy. And don't have your phone also where it's beeping and buzzing and everything else. Um, but it is cool, by the way. The Apple Watch is very neat, and it has some really interesting features associated with it. So and I'm, not, I'm not pushing Apple. They're not a client. But it, but it is a way to show, again, that you are sort of 
up to speed. And don't say, oh, my kids do that, but I don't know what's going on. Because within the companies themselves, they are very plugged into all this stuff. And, and you're just going to appear to be highly irrelevant. Not plugged into the community through organizations, associations, events. I find sometimes people say, well, I want to be involved again in the technology area. And I said, great, what, have you, what organizations you associated with? And they, they mentioned one or two. And I said, well, have you, have you gone to the, this particular society within the Technology Association of Georgia? Or have you gone to this particular meeting in the Metro Atlanta Chamber? Or have you, whatever, have you gone to Kettering? Whatever the, the situation might be. And frequently people will say, yeah, I sort of go, or sometimes I go, or you know, I heard about it. Or in other words, they haven't done any homework to really find out more about these organizations. TAG has like 30,000 members. That's good and bad, right? The good is 30,000 members. The bad is it's a proverbial needle in the haystack when you're looking for a job. And so, but the societies are much more dynamically and specifically focused. So if, if we were, for example, if it was, I was in telecommunications and I had a mobility ex experience and I knew about customer uh, appreciation and customer support, I might go to the, uh, to the telecommunications and the mobility tag, uh, tag society and I would target companies in advance of who I wanted to talk to and I'd be looking around for those various businesses. Frequently I find people that just haven't done any of that, just haven't done the groundwork, they haven't thought about it, haven't gone in and looked at tag. Tag's a good place to go, that tag online website, excellent example. Other groups around town, Metro Atlanta Chamber has a technology council. The technology council, very, very actively focused here. All right, the other thing is, sometimes they're too much plugged into the community. You see people everywhere, okay? They just, they're in every organization, every meeting, and they have really, they sort of lose their relevancy because they're everywhere you turn. And so they're not focused in a particular market. So try it again, try to stay focused, think about creating that brand through writing, you know, writing information on your LinkedIn profile through blogs, through tweets. Not having a team that will follow you or at least a roster of possible players in your team. One of the ways that I try to find credibility when I'm talking to somebody, especially in the sales area uh, or senior leadership, I'll say, listen, if you were to set up your own company, who would, you, who would you put in that company? Who are the people that you'd have around you? Okay, and if they really don't have a very good idea of who they put around them, I'm sort of wondering to myself, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what kind of team player this is. Versus the person that says, well, you know what, if I, had to, if, if I was putting a team together, I'd have Jill from uh, XYZ Company over here as my CFO, and I'd have Joe over here as my VP of Marketing, and I'd have, have Pete over here to come in as my investor. That's what I'd be pulling together. And, and, or if it's a salesperson, man, we'd bring the band back together. So it's very important to think through that and realize that the people that are across the table from you are asking that question for a specific reason. Not appreciating the person you're meeting with is also looking for value and delivering value to them. I remember I was meeting with one person who was looking for a position years ago. This is back in the dot-com era when dot-com blew up. And at the end of the discussion, um, he said, uh, gosh, I really appreciate you making time for me and meeting with me. I want to give you a little something. And he gave me this really cool pet dot-com sock puppet, okay, which today probably is worth maybe $1,000 because it's still in its original container and I've never taken it out. So anyway, it was a way, it was not a lot of value, but it was a way to distinguish himself from others. But what I have found is it's very important, I think, to, to consider what's the value proposition you can provide. Now, how many folks here get the, uh, the daily Harvard Business Review? Um, there's a management tip of the day. Does anybody get that? Okay, I would suggest that if you don't get it, you should. The one today is called When Networking, Know How to Offer Your Help. All right, and this is an excellent one. It says, at the end of a networking meeting, it's not uncommon to ask, so how can I help you? Right, that's value. How can I help you, John? I've been sitting here telling, giving you, and John may come back to me, how can I help you? So this is a nice gesture, but if you've requested the meeting, you should already come with an idea on how you might be able to help. Don't make your colleague do the work. I find this oftentimes, people say, how can I help you, John? Well, I'm a lawyer, I represent technology companies, and I want more clients. So you can't figure out how you can help me? <laughs> Introduce me to people. I want more clients. I want more business. I'd like to help you, but if you can help me, that'd be great. Said so before the meeting, think up a hypothesis of how you can be helpful to them. Throughout your conversation, take subtle questions. Then you can ask us explicitly whether your idea would actually be useful. For instance, if you're meeting an entrepreneur, they're probably looking for new clients. So if you know someone who could use their product or services, they'd probably appreciate an introduction. 
Even small gestures such as sharing their social media posts or commenting on their blogs are thoughtful forms of giving that are likely to be noticed. The article is the right and wrong way to network. All right, so there's the value proposition is very important. And I find people that come to me frequently will say, you know, they'll, they'll provide some value back. But what I'll oftentimes do is I'll try to pull the value out of them. I'll say, okay, John, I'm happy to help you. Tell me, what opportunities have you seen out there? And what I've found is frequently John will say, well, you know, I'm, I've heard that X, Y, and Z companies are looking to fill a particular position. It's not perfect for me, but, and I'll make a note of that because X, Y, and Z company may be prospects for me. Okay, so this kind of information is very valuable. When people have done their homework, that kind of dialogue. So keep that in mind. And finally, not following up with both updates on your status and value delivery. This is a, this is a big problem. I think oftentimes the idea of telling, coming back and telling the person that you've been working with where you are, what the issues are, what you've seen, you know, and providing some additional value back can be important. So the follow-up, um, and that follow-up could be something very, just very simple saying, just want to let you know, thank you for your time, but this is what I'm doing now, or I've looked at this company, do you know somebody there? Just something very short and sweet in that regard. So we tried to cover sort of 14 points, some, some mistakes, but some ways to turn those mistakes into successes. This is a great community. People generally want to help one another here. I think it's probably maybe more so than any other community in the country. And so this is a, you know, just some thoughts about ways to do that. And I guess I would end by saying there's another thing that I've seen in this community that's very valuable, and it was mentioned a bit by, by Larry and Narcy here too, is the community outreach. There are some great organizations, be they United Way, the Metro Atlanta Chamber, or other chamber organizations. If you can get involved with some of those groups, you'll oftentimes find that there are people there that are very willing to help. We're very willing to help connect you up with other groups and organizations. I'll be happy to take some, some questions. I hope this has been helpful. And you know, please share with me your thoughts and please connect with me on LinkedIn too. Thanks. Questions, surely. Uh, John. You, you, you talk uh, LinkedIn as well as John. How much time do you spend on LinkedIn? How much time do I spend on LinkedIn? Yeah, you know, I, I open up LinkedIn early in the day, and I'm using LinkedIn constantly and frequently. I, I guess that's a good question. What I do on LinkedIn, let's say the other day I was, get, I was on the phone and, um, with a private equity fund yesterday, and the guy said, you know, this is Jeff. I'm here. And by the way, I'm here with Joe Doe. Um, and so immediately I went into LinkedIn and put in Joe Doe's name, found out about Joe Doe, found out, you know, he was a UNC grad or something, found out other information about him. So I'm using it in that, in that regard. I'm also using it as, as a tool where I was, there was another situation yesterday where I had a new client and I knew his name was, happened to be very simple like John Smith. And he had a, a partner who had a name uh, and unfortunately, I haven't learned all of my uh, Indian names, but the last name was about eight miles long with a bunch of consonants that, were, that I couldn't pronounce at all. But I, so I didn't even know how to spell the name. So what I did was I was, well, we're, well he was talking to me. I said, I got to know this guy's name because I need to be able to, to you know, call him by name. So I put, went into LinkedIn. I went into Joe Doe's LinkedIn, and then I looked over to the right where you can see, you know, other people that have, looked at Joe Doe's profile, I've also looked at the other profile, and sure enough, that guy was right there. Boom, I kicked, hit, hit on him, was able to pull that information up. So I'm using it in that way all the time. I'm not just sitting in there trying to figure out who I can connect with. Um, so I'd say I have it open all the time. It's a tool that I'm using frequently. But John, one of the issues following up on that, it also has become a discussion here, is how do you manage your time to do that? It takes so much time to get on a technology, not just the emails anymore, okay? But to do what you're doing and following up on LinkedIn, that time is just incredible. Yeah, it, well, it's more of a research tool for me, though, in the sense that, I mean, if, otherwise I'd, you know, in other words, I'm using it as part of my day-to-day -day activity. I'm not just, going, not just going on there. It's like it's, it's open. It's a resource for me. It just makes it very easy for me to understand and connect to people. But do you have, do you have um, thought process and rules that you, you a process that you follow for yourself to routinize that so that it, it becomes uh, not have the... Uh, yeah, it's really, it's a time saver for me. I guess what it is, I open it up and I'm sitting there and, and you know, frequently what I'll do is I'll, I will look at it, especially on the weekends. Now, I guess maybe the answer to this layer is on the weekends, I'll look at it and I'll really clean it up. I'll really take a closer look at it, see what the profile looks like, see if everything is in order. But it doesn't take as much time as you might think. And it's become more of a, it's more of a research tool available for me there. John, I have to, do you, you, you go to the free, there's a free version of LinkedIn. 
I'm, I'm the lowest premium, but I use that primarily for purposes of advanced searches, which I use frequently. The searching capability is terrible in LinkedIn, but I think if you pay more, you get better searching capability. So I haven't figured out all the nuances, but I do pay, I pay a small, uh, small fee there, but it's, it's minuscule. It's a good question. Yes? You talked about um, some of the other social media outlets as well, uh, but you, is, are those ones like be it Twitter, be it Pinterest, be it whatever, are those ones that you just have a working knowledge of but that you really focus in LinkedIn, or do you do those as well? You were talking about the relevance earlier. It's a good question. The question is whether I use LinkedIn and, and other, other tools too. LinkedIn is sort of my base platform. And then what I can do is you can go into LinkedIn and if you want to put like the quote of the day or you want to put in a little blur, I put in a blurb the other day, I'm a Duke basketball fan as Sanders and I were talking about, there was a YouTube video about Cameron Indoor Stadium and Duke basketball. So I went on there and I you know, put in a little blurb, I kept the number of characters down and then within LinkedIn you can hit both, you know, send it to your profile and send it to your LinkedIn, I mean, send it to Twitter. So I just hit that and so I'm sending it out via Twitter and LinkedIn. So if you happen to be you know, following me on Twitter and connecting to me on LinkedIn, you're going to get them both at the same time. But uh, that's how I, I use that platform. The other one's Pinterest, Instagram, I don't really use much at all. Yes? John, back on number eight, on being willing to, uh, you know, do the daily work. Many of us come from sort of Fortune 500 background, big company backgrounds, and our resumes speak to that. So how would you recommend in this process we effectively brand and sell ourselves to be able to wear those many hats and do that work. I mean, that's a, that's a challenge that I think some of us face is, you know, saying we do it, but able to actually demonstrate and brand that we can wear lots of hats and we can serve in a small organization. It's a great question, which is basically how do you, how do you really provide some level of credibility to the, con, to the, uh, to the statement that you're willing to, to do the dirty work. Um, I think in part is really understanding the nature of the company and, and what they do uh, and being in a position to say, listen, I know that we know all these companies are looking for customers. They're all looking for ways to, to build their relationships and connections. Being able to point out how you can help in that regard is one way to do that. Second is, I got to say, it's dress. You know, you walk in there with a coat and tie on like this, they're going to it's just, just not going to resonate with them. So you got to figure out what is the nature of the, of, of the folks that you're talking to. Do you have the business casual attire? So can, I, can I follow up on that? Please. I, because because I, I, in the interview process, I mean, it's been at least you know, drilled into me that you always dress up. So, so, and that's a challenge for exactly that reason. How do you create that connection when you've dressed up, the person sitting on the other side of the table is maybe business casual or even in jeans. I've had that, that situation. I take my coat off, maybe take my tie off, but I've still created that impression that I'm this corporate guy. You, you got, I think what you have to do is gauge in advance, and, and, and I would suggest dressing to the, the appropriate attire, because I think if you walk in with the coat and tie, it's just, we're just not relevant. I mean, I, frankly, it, it's just the way it is. And um, maybe this young lady can give us a... And have your Apple watch there, you sort of pull out every once in a while. <laughs> that would help too. I, I do think that's important. I mean, it is interesting. It's more and more folks are in that mode. And so um, it almost shows that you, you're, you're sensitized to it. That's a good point. Yes. Yeah, John, thank you for all these insights. Just changing the subject slightly. Um, you touched on the relevance of the new technology. And I, and I think for all of us, you know, if I look at the demographics around here, that it may not, not be relevant, as you said, but it, it is relevant. Every company is figuring out how to take this consumer-based technology into the environment. So we can't ignore it. It's there. And every company is figuring out that all of the associates they're hiring now, that's what they're interested in. So for us to say, you know, it's not relevant, it's totally irrelevant, and we have to get with that program. Otherwise, you know, we're going to lose our relevance in the end. So I think it's, it's, it's getting that balance absolutely. It's right. a good point. That's why I think, again, if you can get things, I mean, I take, come back to the financial situation, let's just say, if you can write something or just link to something about the new RevRec standards, or if it's a situation, some customer experience, somewhere, some way to be able to show that you're tied into the way people are communicating. 
Other questions? Narsi. I think that um, first impression within the 15 seconds, they make up their mind. So probably what he may like to do is go one step further ahead of time, have an introduction made from somebody respectable, somebody mutual friend, saying that this person, even though he worked at Rock 10, which is a multi-billion dollar company for so long, he's a down-to-earth guy, practical guy, very concerned about your success if he gets involved in your team. And he can go in the, in the, in the spectrum of frequency, he can go from all, from all the way to the bottom. His mindset, forget about his dress, you know, if you, Paint the picture ahead of time uh, as if this person is a valuable person and will not look like uh, disconnected from the rest of the C-suite. They will be part of it and bring relevance to customers, introductions, whatever. That's a good point. And let me scale them. Right. At some point, your company is going to be scalable into 300, 400 million dollar right. revenue company. He knows or she knows what to do. Let me mention one thing, one final point on that is that some, I think one of the most effective ways to impress a potential employer is, as you say, to make that early impression a positive one. But I'll give you an example. Let's just say it's a situation where you're a, you have a sales background and you walk into that company and you're, you're explaining to them how you understand because you're experienced that there's a process the way things are done. A lot of early stage companies don't have, they're scaling, but they don't have processes. So, by, by your senior person, you know that in order to scale, you have to have process. And that terminology is going to resonate with these, you know, a lot of these entrepreneurial growing companies. And frankly, even some of the larger companies that are now trying to get much larger. And so what you, what you might also do is pull out and say, pull out a, a piece of paper that shows, here's the kind of process that, that you, you're familiar with and that you can help a company with. And you can, you know, you might even have some of their names, some of the information in there to show them how you can do that. In other words, you're already thinking about ways to help them accelerate their business. Or in the finance area, you may say, here's some things that, you know, R&D tax credits being a big issue for some of these companies. A lot of these tech companies have ignored them. Sort of presenting to them some things that lead them to believe, gosh, we haven't been doing that. We could use that. This would be very valuable to us. Maybe we should have this guy come back this gal come back and talk to other members of our team. Great, thank you. Well, last question. Last question. I'll come to squeeze the last question in. Could you quickly talk about the status of early stage investments in Atlanta and organizations like Gathering of Angels and so on? Anything going on? Sure, the status of early stage investing, there's a lot, there are a lot of angels here in town um, who will write you know, modest, modest checks um, we have the Atlanta Technology Angels, we've got Gathering of Angels, a number of other groups which are very, very positive. What we're missing though is that next round, the Series A round. We have very few Series A players and frankly there are very few Series A players in the country right now. So I spend a fair amount of time in Silicon Valley, I'll be in Boston in two weeks, I'll be in Northern Virginia, I'll be in New York, all for purposes of getting, finding those Series A and private equity funds and saying come to Atlanta see our companies and our clients that are here. But there is a lot of early stage, com early stage money. The challenge is getting to that next phase, and we're working on trying to find that next phase now. So keep your, keep your eyes open. I think you'll see some new funds come to town. Just Thank you. Taking the privilege of the host, the follow-up. Great, great question, Chris. Atlanta is, by reputation, entrepreneurial real estate. Anything else, especially old line and old world. How is that changing and are we still real estate or are they moving into that? Everybody says you're going to get out of Atlanta to get real money. Right. Well, th there's no question real estate has been uh, a fairly dominant force. If you look at the Atlanta Business Chronicle, it's a big driver of that publication. However, I think technology now, financial technology, healthcare, IT, uh, e-commerce, you know, cybersecurity, these are all areas that Atlanta is getting a reputation for as a result of some companies that have become very successful. So I think when you look at that, when we talk to people in other sections of the country, they appreciate that value. The key that we may have in this room is a lot of us come from those industries. We come from industries to traditional businesses that these IT companies are trying to sell into. So you have very direct, relevant subject matter experience. 
play off of that experience to be able to go to the companies to say, listen, I might not have been in technology, but I really know the beverage business. Or I might not have been you know, in a particular e-commerce area, but I really know retail. So play on those strengths and then find the companies that are, that are providing services into that market. And I think that it is changing, uh, Larry, and I think we'll see that our community really takes on a much greater focus on technology globally. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.